good morning you guys it's karen and today we are talking about tinazorb um i'll tell you what happened to my hair and why it's weird and stripy at the end <laughs> um but yeah we're talking about tinazorb i did consider doing a video on all of the kind of more popular new sunscreens um this isn't particularly new but there's tinazorb there's juvenile there's i think it's called mexaril um but actually there's enough information i think about tinazorb to just keep it to one video and then i'll do one on juvenile and on mexaril um also the first thing i want to tell you is that tinazorb is not a standalone name um there is tinazorb s tinazorb m tinazorb omc tinazorb a to b so there's various different types of tinazorb so tinazorb is actually the trade name so it doesn't mean an awful lot on its own but for example tinazorb omc is actually octinoxate and octinoxate is one of the chemical sunscreens that we're trying to avoid or a lot of us are trying to avoid and one of the ones that's come up with um you know research not yet in humans but in labs and in animals showing that it can disrupt the hormones mostly when people are talking about newer sunscreens or newer um, formulations they're talking about tinazorb s and tinazorb m so let's talk about why they're so of interest lately there's some benefits some big benefits to tinazorb it is broad spectrum on its own as a chemical sunscreen whereas normally to get broad spectrum you need to use mineral sunscreen so zinc oxide titanium dioxide or you need a really big um, kind of complex mix of sunscreens to achieve broad spectrum broad spectrum meaning that you're covered for uva rays and uvb rays tinazorb is a broad spectrum all on its own the second reason is that it's tinazorb is much more photostable um, a lot of sunscreens aren't stable at all and they actually degrade in sunlight um, and so you know that's why it's really important to reapply whereas this one is much more photo stable and so it's more reliable to cover you if you're out in the sun regarding the dangers to hormones what they say about tinazorb is that it is not expected to affect the endocrine system so it's not expected to affect hormones um, obviously they need to do more research in this area but the mechanism of how it works is not expected to produce any um, dangerous evidence, any evidence that it is going to have the same issues as the other chemical sunscreens. What you need to remember when something is new or novel is that it can seem all singing, all dancing, it can seem like, oh, we found the perfect product. Um, I would say the same thing about the HPR, hydroxypinacolone retinoid or gran active retinoid. It can seem wonderful because it's like, oh, this it does everything that the other product did but it doesn't have any of the dangers etc but you ha you have to have a little question mark there and say but how much of that is because it's new and it hasn't gone through years of research you know there's still a lot of findings come out in the last couple of years about octinoxate octocrylene avobenzone you know all of the other chemical sunscreens um, and so you're constantly learning about their effects um, you know there might be a completely different picture of tinazorb in 10 years time when lots of research has been done but currently it's not expected to have any effects um, there is an unknown effect on coral reefs because that's another reason why some people avoid chemical sunscreens um, they don't know what the effect is there's an unknown effect on that subject though whilst i was looking that up i did learn a lot more about um, the coral reefs and the effects and found out something very interesting which is that the professionals don't believe that sunscreen really contributes very much to the coral reef problem that it is only a tiny tiny problem and that actually the biggest problem is climate change and you know there's other contributors not to mention that it's only really relevant if you are slathering yourself head to toe and swimming near the coral reefs but these experts have given this opinion because hawaii banned some of the um chemical sunscreens that we use here in the UK because of the effect on the coral reef but they have stood up and said actually they don't agree with that decision because they feel that the focus is in the wrong place and that actually that's a minute part of the problem. Okay so why might you choose tinazorb over a mineral sunscreen? The only reason I can think you would choose tinazorb is if you didn't like zinc oxide and titanium dioxide for any reason um, because they're both broad spectrum well zinc oxide is 
truly broad spectrum. So if you're using zinc oxide in the right formulation with titanium dioxide, you are going to have a broad spectrum sunscreen. So they're both broad spectrum. Um, if you don't like zinc oxide and you're using a product with titanium dioxide in, chances are it's got something else chemical in it. So that might be a reason to use Tinazor because it would have one of the chemical um, UV filters that is more likely to cause hormone disruption at this point. You may think that Dinosaur would be a more elegant formula than mineral sunscreen, but that only applies to a non-nano mineral sunscreen because Dinosaur is nano. It is nanotechnology. Um, so if you're trying to avoid nanotechnology, then you would want to avoid Dinosaur anyway. Um, they're both broad spectrum. They've both got the same kind of coverage. You might think there'd be less of a white cast with Tinazorb, but actually most of the mineral formulations nowadays are nanotechnology and therefore don't have a white cast. Let me know what you think. I can't think of any benefit to using Tinazorb over if you currently use and are happy with a mineral sunscreen. So for example, I currently use the Paula's Choice um, <clears throat> Essential Glow and that's zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Now, one of my viewers left me a comment saying that they had emailed Paula's Choice and that they have said, this product is the only one that does not use nanotechnology. However, when you look at the ingredients, it's listed as zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, and in brackets, it says nano. So I need to get around to emailing them and asking them to clarify is it nanotechnology, is it not? But I'm quite happy with that at the moment. And even if it is nanotechnology, I haven't found a non-nano mineral sunscreen um, that I'm happy with. So for me, I've got broad, broad spectrum. Um, I've got a nice formula. It's no white cast. It's photostable because it's, if it's nanotechnology, it's photostable. If they came back and said it was non-nano, um, I might choose Tinazorb for its stability if I was going on holiday. If I knew I was gonna be out in the sun every day, all day, I'm very rarely in the sun. I'm somebody that I walk to my car, I walk from my car to the shops, I walk from my car to people's houses, um, and I will walk Watson, but I will wear sunglasses and sometimes even a cap. I'll walk in the woods, you know, I'll, I'll avoid the sun as much as I can. Doesn't mean I don't need sun protection, of course, but if I was going on a, on a sun holiday, I might choose Tinazorb for its stability and reliability. So hopefully that explains kind of the benefits and why you would choose it. A reason you might not choose it is Tinazorb M has actually has evidence to show that it, it has caused contact dermatitis. Um, so it's caused skin allergies. And that's thought to apply to the whole range of Tinazorb um, filters because of the ingredients that that they need to put with the base ingredients. So for example, Tinazorb S is bimotrizonal. I'm not sure how you say this. Tinazorb M is biso, bisoctrizal. Tinazorb A to B is tribiphenyl triazine, you know. So those ingredients are coupled with something else to make this Tinazorb and they're thought to be potential irritants. So if you've got a sensitive skin, you might wanna stay away from this. That's as much as I can explain. Hopefully that was clear enough. I'm, I'm still a little bit confused about it all. I mean, the, the world of sunscreens is so deep and complex that actually I've been thinking this past week, I've been thinking, you know what, I think I'd be better just wearing a hat because, especially because I can't find something non-nano and if I really want to avoid the risks, the best thing to do is to wear sun protection clothing you know, wear it right up there, put, maybe put some sunscreen on your hands um, and wear a big sun hat. I think that that's probably the best thing you can do. Um, okay, so let me tell you about a couple of products I found with Tinazorb in. The first one I really want to mention because it's recommended by you guys regularly and it's called Altruist. It's very affordable. It's £7.50 for, I think that might be for two tubes. Even if it's one tube, that's really good. I used Altruist, I gave one of the tubes away, I bought a two, two tube packet, used one, and it appeared in my favourites at least a year ago, maybe two. Um, I got it from Amazon, I, I will link it of course, and it, it felt lovely, it was a really nice SPF 50, really nice ethos of the company, um, everything's great about it, it has Tinazorb in it. However, the Tinazorb that's in it is A to B, so it's not one of the newer popular ones, i.e. Tinazorb S and Tinazorb M, it's Tinazorb A to B. 
um, and it has octocrylene in it as well. So it's not just Tinazorb, they've added in octocrylene, which is one of the chemically concerning UV filters. So, uh, you know, if, if when I was talking about why you would buy Tinazorb over anything else, over the chemical one, it wouldn't really apply to this because it has octocrylene in it. Um, number two is Medicaid. I, I really searched everywhere to try and find um, formulas with Tinazorb in it, but there's a lot more in Europe. There seems to be a lot, um, like in Germany, and a lot more that you could buy from European websites, but I don't know those websites, I don't know those products, I don't know those brands, so I wouldn't be so keen to try them or, even, or recommend them, certainly. Um, you won't get them in the USA, by the way, because this Tinazorb is not... Um, been approved in the USA. They want more testing done. They're asking more questions. And in some ways you could say that's good because um, the USA is more stringent on SPF. And so, you know, they're more picky and they're more, they want more information and more research done. And so it takes a lot longer for something to be approved that's an SPF. Um, but there's also articles out there that are saying, does the EU have better sunscreen? Because there's this wonderful, so-called wonderful new ingredient and you can't get it in the US. You can buy it, but you'd have to buy it from outside of the US. So yeah, I was saying that I really struggled to find products. I found these three, all truest. The second one is Medicaid that I was mentioning. This Medicaid one is a combination of Uvinel A, which I will talk about in a separate video, and Tinazorb S, which is good. If you're going to use any of these four, I would say go for Tinazorb S if you can, and if not, Tinazorb M. But remember, Tinazorb M has been proven to have contact dermatitis. Um, the Medicaid one, however, although it sounds wonderful, it has a huge amount of fragrance in it. I have no idea why they've put so much fragrance in it. I looked and the first one I saw was lemon peel. I mean, I just don't understand. Fragrance to me is bad anyway, but to put it in something where you're going to be out in the sun, that's the idea, isn't it? it fragrance and sun just do not go together at all um so it's got lemon peel in it and from the lemon peel onwards there's just fragrance after fragrance after fragrance so that's not one i would recommend but it does have a good combination of spf in it um the final one is one i've actually used and it's this one. this is the face theory sun fragma spf 25 melting balm they now do this in a tube um and so when i finish this i will definitely be getting the tube Mine is less oily now. I've done a whole review on this, so I'll link that for you. But I, when I did the review, I tipped this up and oil went everywhere. Um, but this is what it looks like. And this is an SPF 25. Like I said, that comes in a tube now. But they are also coming out with an SPF 50, which I assume will also be Tinazorb S. Let me just double check my notes. Yes, Tinazorb S. So this is the one that I said I would recommend being your first choice, Tinazorb S. So that is what it's like. I'm showing you it because it leaves a shine. And I did read one paragraph somewhere saying that Tinazorb would not be appealing to people with oily skin. And I can't really get any further information than that anywhere. I can't dig deeper into that and find out why. But certainly this one, if you've got oily skin, you may be put off because it does leave a shine. Now, in my video using this, I showed you me putting it on and what I said in that was, it's absolutely fine under makeup. There's no problem at all under makeup, which you wouldn't think. It doesn't absorb, um, but it's fine under makeup. But if you don't wear makeup, so I have tried it under makeup and and not when I, on, a, on a day where I'm not wearing any makeup and it, did, it literally never absorbed. My face was shiny all day. Now, you could put powder on top of it if it bothered you, um, but it's one that I would not use unless I was wearing makeup. But under makeup, it's fine. I wouldn't expect that. You know, I would expect if something had a sort of shine and didn't absorb that makeup wouldn't sit well on top of it, but it was absolutely fine. I haven't used this much. I'm actually gonna switch over and start using this so that I can hopefully get to the bottom and give you a view in my empties of this. Um, and I'd really like to use it from the tube as well. That'd be much better. Just a note about jars, actually. Somebody left me a comment telling me to watch somebody's video about oxidation and how it wasn't a problem. I'm not bothered about oxi oxidation, that isn't my issue. My issue is that your instinct is to, is to put your fingers in and that will change the product. That will change everything about the product. It will change how hygienic it is because you know, you've know you got germs on your fingers. It will change the pH. Um, I just, 
it just means that I have to use a cotton bud and that's a bit more um, a bit more of a pain. Okay, so that's everything to tell you about Tinazorb. Hopefully that was useful to you and interesting. Let me know what your thoughts are on the whole sunscreen thing and what one you're using and what one you're not. I'm realizing a lot on YouTube that with the opinions of people, it's all about your personality. Because for example, when I did that video um, a year or so ago on about tretinoin and is it toxic? Because there was a big research study where people died, etc., And people respond to that depending on their personality. If you are somebody that's a kind of a risk taker and who doesn't really worry about things unless there's absolutely 100% solid proof, then you would just like, oh, that's nonsense, I'm gonna keep on using it. If you are somebody that's an anxious person or a worrier, then you might respond going, oh my God, I didn't know that, I'm never gonna use it again, you know. And I think the same will be with sunscreens. If you're somebody that's really, really into products, uh, ingredients, and if there's some evidence of a bad side effect, then you want to avoid it, then, you know, you might want to go for this Tinazorb, um, or you might prefer, like me, to stay with your mineral sunscreen. So I'd love to hear your thoughts anyway. Thank you so much for watching. Let me tell you what I've got on makeup wise. Oh, did I say I was gonna tell you about my crazy hair as well? Yeah, okay, so makeup wise, I've got on Laura Mercier Silk Cream Foundation in June. June, I think is the color. It's 3C1, but June, D-U-E-N, D-U-N-E. <laughs> um, on my eyes is a gosh pigment. It doesn't have a name, but it's 005. I'll try and find it and link it for you because it's beautiful and there's not many pigments that are um, really good, cruelty-free, drugstore, vegan, and gosh is. Um, so that's what's on my eyes. On my cheeks is Makeup Geek Blush in Romance. My lips, as always, is the Stila Liquid Lipstick in Caramello, and I use this on top. This is the Primark Lip, Glo lip Gloss. I'll definitely repurchase this, you know. It's split. The top is split, so it's not the greatest packaging, but the product itself, I love it, um, really love it. It's a nice lip gloss that's not sticky, and it kind of moisturizes your lips as well, so really like that. What is it called? Plumping lip gloss. I don't find that it plumps, just say it. <laughs> okay, hair. What happened with my hair? Right, let me try and be succinct if I can. I went back to my natural color recently, as a lot of you will know, and as I said on screen, I didn't love it. I felt that it was really bland. It's described as strawberry blonde, my natural color. I actually thought my hair was more red. I thought it was more auburn. But it turns out that when I put these dyes on, they've been getting more and more permanent as the years have gone on. You know, I used to be able to put a color on and wash it out in a couple of days. Even five years ago, when I started YouTube, I could put a wash in, wash out color and it would be gone within a month. Whereas this, and it's the same one, it's the um, Scott Cornwall color restore that I used on my hair just now. Um, it just wouldn't wash out of my hair and I ended up using a color removal system. Um, that's how I know that I was back to my own natural color. But like I said, it was too bland to me. I wanted something a bit warmer because I'm quite pale and you know I do self tan, but I wanted something to sort of warm up my complexion. I like red. My husband doesn't love it this bright red, which is why I only ever had it done temporarily because do you remember that caused all the hassle where people started saying Kev was controlling? Kev says, I can do what I, I like with my hair, but call me crazy, I want him to find me attractive and he doesn't like this bright red look. So what I thought I would do is I thought I might get low lights. So, you know, just some of this red color blended in with my color, which you can see my color here, looks like a mousy brown there now, doesn't it? Um, but I have never had color done at a hairdresser's. So I have no idea, you know, I don't have a place to go and even the place that I go for haircuts I've had to switch hairdressers because she's left the one that I was using has left and I don't know where she's gone um, and I didn't love my last haircut so I don't know anybody that I trust enough to do a permanent hair color I need to spend time looking up reviews or finding somebody I know that has color done and trust somebody with their hair you know because it's expensive I'm sure it's going to be what, 100 pound or something because it's 50 pound for my hair for a haircut so I'm sure it'll be another 50 pound for color and it's permanent you know so I want to really make sure I make the right decision so what I thought I would do is I thought I would use the color restore that I had left over from Scott Cornwall it's just a tube of conditioner it's a really simple way of, of dyeing your hair I'm surprised it comes out so bright 
and I also had this sort of funny shaped comb that for highlights um, not that I've ever done highlights on my hair but that was what the comb was for and I bought it specifically to try this low light thing and so I, I got the brush put some of the dye in put it what I thought was evenly washed it out blow dried my hair this is yesterday and oh my goodness it was so patchy there was a big patch here of hair that had no color in it at all then this bit was all actually looked quite nice on this side but the bottom bit was you know still needed doing so even though i couldn't be bothered i thought i'm gonna have to do this again and i, I did it on dry hair i didn't know if the conditioner would take but i'd only, literally only just blow dried it so i knew my hair was clean and i thought at least that way i can see where it's missing so i put combed it through with this special comb then i combed it through with a normal comb and i think that's the mistake i made because it sort of distributed everything so much so that it doesn't look like the stripes it should if you know what i mean or it doesn't look like sections have been colored it more made concentrated color but it's now super patchy because there's bits that i didn't get at all so there's that bit there that bit there if you look at my head that way you can see i didn't get any of that but it just looks really really odd so that's what's happened so i'm kind of annoyed at myself um but I do love this colour, so I don't know whether to try and even it out yet again. I can't be bothered today and, you know, it won't happen in the next couple of days. I don't know whether to even it out and just go, you know what, I need to dye all of my hair <laughs> this colour. Or whether to just try and start washing this out as much as I can whilst investigating a hairdresser that can give me low lights. Because um, my worry as well is if I have permanent low lights and Kev doesn't like it, I won't like that, you know. Um, whereas at least this will mostly wash out. Right, that was a long story. I was going to try and be succinct. I don't think I achieved that, did I? Um, anyway, thank you very much for watching today. I hope that you enjoyed it and I will speak to you again soon.